All right, and we are live. Hello, Internet. This is Kyle Bazzi, president here at Benzinga and MarketFi. With me is uh, Tim Melvin. Tim, say hi to the camera. Hello, camera. How are you this evening? Tim is a, uh, a well-renowned, uh, world-renowned writer in value investing. We're here today to do another book review. We actually got some pretty, some pretty solid feedback from the last one, right, Tim? Yeah, we, people enjoyed it. Um, got a lot out of it, good information, and just a little something different than just recommending stocks and talking about markets all day. Um, and today is actually right on Wheelhouse. So we're, we're uh, doing a review on the Warren Buffett's Next Door, the world's greatest investors you've never heard of and what you can learn from them by Forbes editor Matt Schifron. So um, this is, I mean, this is this is all we go over. I was actually down in Orlando at the Money Show and I saw Tim. That's where he resides and won't let me forget that we're still getting six inches of snow every day up here in Detroit. So um, we actually <laughs> talked a lot about your strategy and everything you do. But um, just to give a quick overview on the book, what Matt did, Matt Schifron, the author, is um, through all his connections, he went around and uh, just interviewed a ton of these um, Warren Buffett's next door. There's these sites like Marketocracy and, and others where regular investors are rated based off of their performance on the site. And um, it's, you know, quote unquote verified. Some of it's real money, some of it's play money, and we'll get into that later. But, um, and what he pretty much did was said, hey, you guys are not only beating the market, but you're beating most of the, you know, huge money managers out there and he went through and, and figured out not only what was their strategy but also who they were and I think that's a really cool concept of the book that comes through um, is about who these people are because you can really relate to that so um, the book goes through a bunch of um, interviews and you know life stories and the strategies of these people um, shows their you know returns and and you know what they've done and kind of wraps it up with some lessons to be learned. So really cool book. Uh, I don't know about you, Tim. I think it's a really good read because it is not about you know how many books out there are. I'm an expert. You know here's what I did, and really a lot of times I can't be related to the everyday person. Yeah, no, that that's correct. And these are people who are from a wide variety of life. Over half of them don't have a college degree. Um, the I, found majority that of them, I, mean, I found that interesting. Uh, I, I, it's more normal than you realize. I don't have a college degree, for instance. The first time I ever set foot on a college campus, I was given a lecture on invest. So, um, I think that um, you actually get hurt by some of what they teach you as gospel in business school because markets are not efficient. Discounted cash flows are not the best way to evaluate stocks as an outside investor. So I think that rather than expanding your mind, I think the college education for an investor can actually close your mind a little bit. Um, so I, I found it interesting, but um, you know, smart guys that didn't go to college that are inquisitive and willing to do the work are probably going to usually outperform most professional money managers. In fact, the one point that the book really drives home, and this is the single most important reason to read the book is that individual investors, we hear all the time, especially sales pitches from Wall Street, that you can't beat the professionals. Individuals have such huge advantages in terms of time, size, lack of an institutional mandate, and short-term you know, time frames that they have to deal with, that if they pick a style and stick to it, they should always outperform the professionals. They have massive we have massive advantages over the institutions. Most people do not take advantage of them. The folks in this book, for the most part, did. Let's let's talk about that real quick. What? Let's go a little more in depth. The massive advantages. One of them, and I see this all the time, is actually being in stocks that these you know multi multi hundred million dollar funds can't be in because they can't trade them. Now there's also inherited risk in that, but you know that's part of you doing your research. But touch on that real quick, Tim, because I know you have um, some really really cool things you're doing uh, in in those kind of stocks. And then let's talk about some of the other advantages we have. Yeah, our biggest advantage is we can really go where they can't. We can buy 15, 20, 25 million dollar, 100 million dollar companies that the large funds just can't even look at. But, but there's risk care. in that too. So everyone will talk about that as, you know, because you see all that scammy crap out there about, you know, buy this yeah, five cent stock that's going to go to $10 or whatever. But you got to do your, you still got to do your research. 
Right, and you probably don't want to be in the five cent stocks. I mean, just because a company, <coughs> excuse me, has a low market cap doesn't mean it's necessarily a really low price stock. So you want to be in real company, or real business, but that you know aren't as big as IBM. And whether you're a value or a growth guy, it's the smaller companies that have the most upside and most potential as they grow into larger market caps and Wall Street does become interested in the, in the stocks. So that's a huge advantage for us as individuals. We can go where they can't. Okay, give me another one. The biggest one's time. No, the second biggest one's time. Um, Wall Street does not, as you know, have a very long time frame. And there's the average mutual fund turns over more than 100 a year, so does the average hedge fund. You and I can own a stock for as long as we want. Nobody's reading our quarterly reports going, why does that jackass own that stock? You know, or what is that still doing in the portfolio? Um, or how come you don't have Amazon in your mutual fund? We can hold stuff as long as we want to. We don't have any bosses except ourselves telling us that we have to own all the other stuff everybody else owns. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The time, the timing uh, about what, what you're doing, and then like you said, there's, there's no one to answer to. No investors, no employees, no people. We kind of, um, you know, we, we go where, where we wish. I agree with that, and I, I think that um, we'll get into some of the, the lessons I learned in the, or, you know, you, you read about and learned in the book. Um, one, and we talk about this all the time, Tim, is the underlying theme to any strategy, any, doesn't matter if you're an investor, trader, short term, swing, doesn't matter, is discipline individually. And what I liked about the book was it really detailed who these people were, right? So, I mean, they went into marriage and, you know, what was their background and, you know, like you said, college educated or not. They went into how they lived beforehand. They, they, went, they just went into a, an incredible amount of detail on these people's personal lives. So I thought that was big because no one – I don't read a lot about that from – the retail side, or I don't see any of that from the retail side. I see it on MarketFi and Benzinga, but I don't see it, you know, out there anywhere else when I'm talking to people. Right. Uh, I I think it was just an absolutely fabulous book that you know drives home that you can beat the market. You know, you don't have to rely necessarily on the professionals. In fact, the one one of the guys in the book, I'm just looking for the name, um, very much relied on the professionals for a very large account. Um, that he had put together, and it was his wife. <laughs> we finally married at age 40 and said, hey, Bob, what are you doing? You're a smart guy. You can do better than these other guys. And he sat down and he figured out, hey, I can do better. And a lot of them didn't start till later. There was several several of the, the people that Matt in the book highlighted, which started in their 40s and even their 50s, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, the most interesting guy in, in the book by far is Christopher Reese, who's outlined in the first chapter. Um, and he really came to it late and used it to pay for his adventures. Um, he would make money in the market. He'd use it to take a trip, but he didn't really settle down until about 10 years ago, and I think the guy's pretty close to my age, if I understood it. I mean, he just sailed for 14 years uh, for a living, so he's got to be fairly close to my age. But what a fascinating guy. I mean, he's just trekked all over the world, had all these adventures, um, paid for it, most of the last half of his travels through the stock market. Now that he's settled down and is older, he's compounding the profits and just staying in his little village down there in Costa Rica that he's yeah. managed to buy. Must, must but, be nice. uh, yeah, and you know, you've you've got the Michigan guy who runs the computer lab, uh, Kai Patanen. I think yep. I hope I'm saying that right. And he's at the University of Michigan, and um, he wouldn't really shout as an investor either. He just was running the computer lab at the business school and started playing with stuff. So there's some fascinating guys in here. They're all crushing the market for the most part. And, and you know, if you actually read the book and you go to the chapters, it'll give a lot of the resources that the people use, and, and you guys can check that out from screeners to tools to web information. Um, what uh, what I want to get into, so we kind of you got you got a good foundation for what the book is going to do. It's you know going to teach you about how regular people are are actually doing this, which I think is a a wicked cool concept um, because that's what we preach here. And secondly, what I want to go over now is let's talk about some of the the themes that you and I saw from these people. Okay, okay. what was what was common? Because there were some differences. There, you know, it was uh, the strategies varied. You know, what maybe what the data or the um, uh, what they were looking at in terms of the stocks, you know, kind of varied. What sectors, things like that. Um, the first one that I got, and you know, I wrote it down when I was reading the book, and I'd circle it everywhere I'd find it. Um, and it's something that you and I um, are like 
minded on is value, value, value. So yeah. look for the market disconnects. Um, I think I read an article on Matt um, actually talk, talking about the book, and he said, look for the market disconnects. The way yes. I look at it is value is the best and most battle-tested market disconnect, right? I'm um, looking for undervalued stocks. Where some of the other stuff, um, you know, FDA and biotech, it, it's, it's far less more likely, uh, far less likely um, there, than there value. Was, there was a biotech guy among those in the book, and there mm -hmm. was also a guy who does a lot with uh, junior miners and energy. And the two things that, that you would pick out is how guys succeed in the market and, as individuals. One is the value approach. Most of the guys outlined in this book are using some form of value investing. Uh, Chris Rees with just very plain and simple doing pretty much the same thing I am on a little more concentrated basis, tangible book value. That's his focus. You've got uh, Patanin up in uh, Michigan who has an 11 point value checklist that he's developed using uh, academic quantitative studies. Um, you have one chartist and you have one uh, momentum guy. They have mm -hmm. the lowest returns of everybody. So the real performance has been by the value guys, and those, like uh, Jack Whalen in the book who's doing um, primarily biotech stocks, and then the guy who's doing the junior miners and actually helping doing financing deals, very specialized, superior knowledge set to the industry group that they're investing in. They have a laser focus on a particular part of the market. If you have that sort of specialized knowledge, then you have that available. I mean, my specialized knowledge goes to wine and baseball, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't uh, say baseball. I don't think you're. I don't think you're specialized in it. I give you wine. Uh, you know. You know. Look, just because your team got lucky last year doesn't uh, doesn't make you guys baseball experts up there in Detroit. <laughs> but um, everybody was using some sort of value. You know, one guy was developing macro top-down themes and then looking for John Templeton-style stocks within the theme. Um, so most of these, some form of value investing. So that, that definitely I took away from that as well. So here's, here's a concept I want to connect because what we're talking about, I agree, it's market disconnects, but I am of the frame of thought for the average person, value is – one of them, I wouldn't say the easiest market is disconnect to um, to find, but it's the most, it's the one that can is the the best to implement, easiest to implement for people. And the reason yeah. I'm saying that is because I, I I love charting actually, and I know you 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 know you're straight value, and I, but I love charting. I love I love a lot of the um, the other strategies that are you know shorter term holdings things like that. But the difference is the point is it's discipline. So. We are all human beings are the worst type of um, trader. I mean, it's funny to say that you know we look at machines and algorithms, but human beings are the worst the worst kind of trader because we get in our own way. So value to me is the um, is the easiest for us not to screw it up. Um, whereas charting and those all those other things, it's so quick, especially in the shorter time frames, um, that we'll get in our own way. So I, that's the kind of connection when I was reading the book that made a lot of sense to me that I haven't really thought about before. Yeah, it's um. Here, here's the problem. Let me just touch on it real quick with charting for the average guy. Um, most char chart patterns studied, study them statistically, are a flip of the coin. Okay, what happens is the guys who really trade well on charts study them so much they kind of pick up an intuitive feel for the underlying psychology of a particular pattern. And of course, as you said, they have extreme discipline. But for the average investor who wants to consistently beat the market and earn high rates of return, using a value strategy does not involve sitting up until 2 in the morning pouring over the new chart books that just came in the mail. Um, that's a very difficult craft. Very few people are actually good at it. As you know, most of what's sold to the public is charting systems is absolute mm -hmm. crap. Um, the guys that are able to do it spend 10 hours, 12 hours a day. And I think a lot of the success has to do with learning an intuitive feel from market movements, from that type of intense study. Um, but if you have, you know, wife, kids, job, hobby, all that other fun stuff, you don't have 10 hours a day to spend examining chart patterns. Whereas a value, you know, it, it, it's a set it and forget it strategy. You hold it till it works. You don't have to be tied to that computer or that chart book 10 hours a day. All right, so we got number one, looking for market disconnects. I think the point we're both making is value is the easiest for the average person to implement. Now, it doesn't mean it's easy. 
It means it's the easiest no. one with the, with the highest rate of success, in my opinion. Um, number two is discipline. So I can't preach this enough. You have to you have to know who you are to be a good investor. I I, I truly believe that. If you if you you know you want to um, you know, kind of go to all hell with it and say, I'm going to do what I want to do. It'll, you, you'll screw yourself and blow up your account more than, you know, obviously more than, more than you can handle because you will, you will not be investing very long or trading because uh, discipline is so huge. Number three, that I, the book, everywhere in the book, and it, this might tie into value, but fear and greed. Fear and greed. And in all the examples we went through, you know, people were looking for those investors were looking for that fear to invest into, and they would sell into that greed when, um, you know, if it was something they're holding, and they'd stay away from the greed too. And I, I think that goes back to value because you know the value would be in it if everyone's afraid of it. But that was a, a concept throughout the book that I read across each chapter. Yeah, it's and individual investors. I mean, where they where they start to give up their advantage is they you know they do not buy low, sell high. They do exactly the opposite. We get sucked into market euphoria. We're buying the top performing names in the short term, and and that's just absolute death for an individual investor. When it's time to exit and you're buying at new highs, that door is going to be awful crowded. You're going to end up losing money. Um, so you have to learn to play the different greed cycle and step back from the herd and make it work for you instead of against you. And you're right; that is kind of throughout the book. It's it's a concept. You know, turn off the. I want to turn off CNBC. Like turn, you, you want to get away from all of that and make your own, um, your own own ideas on the market, and you'll see a lot more where that fear and greed comes from. It's easy to look back on a chart and see it, but when you're actually in it to see what the fear and the greed actually are. Uh, the next, the next one that I, I circled was time. One, one thing that I get a lot here uh, with the products on MarketFi, and you know, even the newsletters you run on value investing on MarketFi. Is time because people don't have it right and one of the things that I did see was I mean these guys were obsessed with the markets and they were you know there was guys that would download the uh, the conference calls from earnings calls and to CDs and listen to them and he'd take his kid to, to school you know so there, there was a, a really big time commitment so uh, sitting here not not an expert in investing when I asked someone like you uh, Tim what would you what would you say to me that would uh, that I could actually you know still play in the game? So what you have a you have a very steep but fast learning curve, uh, particularly to the value stuff that I do. Initially, when you're starting out, there's a tremendous amount to learn, and it would be the same with you know a quantitatively driven momentum strategy like a Nap Navalier or a Driehaus uses to great success, and one of the guys in the book used with uh, a certain amount of success. Your front end is going to be really steep because you're going to have to spend some time learning how the investing process works. But once you have it, again, you're going to get into a set it and forget it. Your time commitment is going to come down because you know what you're doing and what you're looking for. And if you notice, most of these guys, you know, they're working a few hours a day at this. Now that they've got their routine down, they're not on this all the all day all the time. You know, the one guy's living down in Costa Rica. The other guy's, you know, just, uh, traveling around the world. So, once you've got the knowledge, it's yours. Nobody can take it away from you, and your your time commitment can go down a little bit. All right. So I, I have one more, and, and I don't know if you have you want to put some in here too. The something I never really thought about because um, you know we we always hear diversification, right? Um, when you got you're getting your your retirement planned out or you're getting you know what what you're doing with your money and how you should be diversified but the book actually kind of preaches a little bit a lack of diversification because diversification you might as well just go buy an index so what 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 are your, what are your thoughts on on that concept well my friend more to, towards the original Ben Graham kind of Walter Schloss I tend to own a lot of stocks as you know but I'm not afraid to be concentrated in um, sectors or parts of the market. I don't sit here and uh, figure out the correlation uh, of my stocks to each other. So, and I don't have bonds in my portfolio and I'm not, you know, out buying trees or timber or other alternative assets to make sure I'm properly diversified. I own stocks. So, yeah, I, I don't think that diversification is quite the tool, especially now 
that correlations have collapsed pretty much zero across all asset classes, that diversi diversification is that important at all. I do agree. I agree. Um, so overall, the book, Tim, I mean, I, I recommend it as a read. What I, what I really liked about it was, like I said, you, it really pulled everyday people. This wasn't something that I was reading. We've all seen the books of, you know, buy high, sell higher, and all these experts writing about all this crap. <laughs> Uh, it was it was real it was interviews of real people and I think Matt really laid it out in easy really easy read uh, I thought it was a very fun read and also gives you in each chapter different tools that people use too so it was also kind of a, a cool resource that that I found a lot out of it too uh, we should do grades I don't we've never you know we don't do grades but you know I'd probably give it like a B plus A minus. Uh, yeah, yeah. But let me cover one more guy that's in the book that more investors should be using this strategy. Um, this guy's really smart. He actually, I think, got written up in Barron's a few years ago, if I recall. It's the second chapter, Bob Krebs. Now, what Mr. Krebs is doing is brilliant, and I've always said that if you ever want to conquer the world, get a good value guy and a good options guy together and let them run a portfolio. Now, he does it on different stocks than we have used this tool in the past. This, what he does, done properly, is the most efficient and profitable way to invest your money. He finds a stock that he likes. He sells a put, <coughs> retaining enough cash to fully pay for the stock, by the way. So he will sell a put to buy the stock that he already wants to buy at this price anyway. So he's going to get a 2 3% premium per month to sell that put. He's going to buy the stock. As the stock moves up, <coughs> excuse me. It gets to a point where he wants to sell it, he sells a call. And he only uses it with high dividend stocks, okay, which is pretty clever. It's even more clever to, own, to use it with stocks trading below book value. right? You know you want to own the stock. It's an $11 stock, so you sell the 10 put. If it doesn't go under 10, fine, you keep the premium. If it goes under 10, you buy the stock keep the premium. Now when it gets up to your target price, you're going to sell a call to get out instead of just selling the stock. This adds you know, as much as 10% a year to your return just from the stocks. Because in a sideways market, you're going to be able to sell the puts two or three times before the stock drops and it's hit to you. So you've collected you know, 12 to 15% in premiums over a few months before you ever bought the stock. Now the stock goes up, you're going to take in another four, five, six percent from selling call premiums until it's called away. This is a strategy that deserves more attention than it's given. Now he uses it on high dividend stocks and uh, done it successfully. I know guys that have done this with value stocks where they're, they're just mind numbing. They're they're sick. You say high dividend. What kind of dividend would would you consider? He, he's, if you look at case study, he was doing it on like mortgage rates and stuff, the 14 and 15 percent yield. So yeah. the only the, your risk really lies in not owning the stock if it goes up from from the original place you sold the put, right? Yeah, that's that's really it. Um, if you told the side to fully pay for the stock and don't use maximum margin, this sets up the reward exactly like a covered call. Okay, it's exactly the same. Now. The key to the strategy is you have to want to own the stock at the current price. So but if you find one, and there's, there's few around in 2008 where I was more aggressive using this, there were just literally you know, hundreds of them around. Stocks trading at 80% of book value, optionable stocks, where you could sell a strike out one strike down from the current price, near, you know, uh, close near the money. Um, and when the stock got put to you, you were comfortable. It was at you know it was at eighty percent of book. Now it's at seventy five percent of book, and you like the company. And then as it goes up, you can sell the premium to exit the position. You add a lot of percentage points to your overall turn doing that. How well, far out do you how far how far out do you sell that put? Not for I, won't, I, I won't go more than three months. Three months. Um, yeah, and he made an important point in the book, and I've seen people killed by this. You sell a put for a buck on a $20 stock in a high volatility period in the market. You go three months out, you collect your dollar, it's all good. The stock goes up, the put drops to $0.10 cents within the first month. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't close the position, you just figure it out, just let it run off the books. Then the stock collapses, right, and goes… You should have you know, bought it back. 
Okay. Yep. Same with a cover call. Buy it back. Um, but if you really concentrate and focus on, I want to own this stock anyway. I'm comfortable with it. You don't use excessive amounts of leverage. Then selling options around value-oriented stocks is probably going to be one of the most successful investment strategies that an individual can use. I love this strategy. I was really happy to see it in the book. Um, the term naked puts scares the hell out of most people. And that's because they're selling puts on Green Mountain Coffee and Tesla and you know they're only posting minimum margin and those stocks can roll over so fast and the moves are so large that you know you're just you're wiped out before you got up in the morning. <laughs> but if you use it in conjunction with a value strategy and you take the time initially to get a good understanding of options pricing and how it works, you should be able to consistently beat all hell out of the market. That is, yeah, we talked about the um, lowering your cost when, when, we, when I was in town, and that was something I was very interested in. Could you, because technically when you sold that put, I guess you could you could hedge it with, with something right away, but it would obviously just kind of take some of the allure away. You, you want to hedge it with knowledge about the company, okay? Rather than just saying, hey, I can get a fat premium on um, Lululemon puts right now. So I don't know crap about the company other than they make screw pants, um, but I'm going to go ahead and sell these puts because it's going to give me a lot of premium. Um, that's dangerous. Now, let's take a you know I know um, alpha and omega semiconductor almost inside and out at this point. This is seventy percent of book value. All right, if I sell puts and they put that stock to me. I could. I'm thrilled. I'm happy. I want to own it here. The stock's at 70% of book value, with a patent portfolio that's probably worth as much as the price of the stock. Never mind the actual underlying semiconductor business. Um, so you're you're hedging with knowledge of the company and a desire to own it at the current price. That's what makes this makes this work. I like that. No, that, that was a good one. Um, real quick, touch on. I want you to touch on because we spoke about it before we get on here, and. We'll end in a couple minutes because we like to keep these right around 30 minutes or whatever. But what you know, we talked about some of those guys were using their real money and some of them weren't because uh, where they're being tracked was that that site marketocracy where you didn't necessarily have to have um, actual real money behind it. Going a little bit into that because I was I was a little wary of it um, in the beginning just because if it's not real money, it's not real to me. It's not real to me either. I mean, it's you're just playing around. Uh, you, you, you have a whole different decision process of, oh, gee, this makes me look bad on paper. Oh, Christ, there goes Junior's College Fund. <laughs> you know, that's a whole <laughs> different mindset. So the ones doing it on, you know, on paper, it's a learning experience. It's interesting to discuss. It really doesn't have a lot of meaning. All right, final takeaway from the book. Uh, individuals can beat the market. They should focus on uh, probably a value approach unless they have very specialized knowledge about a, a specific industry. But if they spend the time up front to learn how to properly value, take advantage of the market disconnect, and use all the advantages that you have as an individual, you should be able to beat the market uh, consistently uh, over time without using professional money managers or you know high-fee products uh, and that sort of thing. All right. Well, I am. Uh, I, I can say confidently that your your knowledge in the markets is much better in baseball. So I uh, I agree, and I, I would just add uh, I'd add discipline, discipline, discipline. That's the number one thing that or requests or piece of um, education that I always get requested here, and it's the underlying factor I think to success or failure is uh, knowing who you are and and being comfortable with the decision that you can make. So definitely say that. All right. Uh, next up, uh, great book. So go, I would definitely recommend the Warren Buffett's Next Door by Matt Schifron. Go to Amazon; you can get it there yeah. pretty cheap. It's a very quick, easy read, too, by the way. Yeah, real quick. Um, all right, next next book we're, we are doing is the Shipping Man, correct? So it's called the Shipping Man. Who's it by? I'm actually really excited about uh, this one. I forget the guy's name that wrote the book. Uh, Matthew Fantastic. McClary. Yes, thank you. Matthew McCleary. Fantastic yeah. book. You know, lots of life lessons, market lessons, and just a great story, I thought. So that one will be fun to talk about. 
All right. Well, that's uh, that's gonna wrap it up from here. Um, Tim, have a, a, a great time. I'm, I'm I think I'm gonna sort of come back to Orlando. I just got back from New York and it's freezing there too. So I'm uh, yeah, warm weather. Springs training uh, opens up the games next week. It's that's just right. A just to piss you off, I'm going to the Detroit Atlanta game, the very first. <laughs> what the uh, that's, that's on the 28th, and uh, I will be kind of blowing up your phone with pictures of that nice sunny day down here at the at the Disneyland Disney World Fields uh, when the Tigers take the field for the first time. You you still text me at least twice a week the weather report of Florida as you know we're getting dumped on up here. So I I really appreciate it. It makes me feel really good. Yeah, and no, my daughter loves it too. She made bad words the other day when she had about eight, eight inches of snow on the ground, and we were down here, and it was almost eighty. So she she didn't care for my uh, my uh, texting the weather reports too much at all. Um, what was the uh, uh, last thing I was going to say before we signed off? I forgot. Um, oh, we got a new skipper. That's what I was going to say. So I'm excited to see him kind of in action here because we need something to get us over the hump. Saw an interview with him. Well, I, I, I texted you that uh, they were on. Uh, He's young. MLB doing the Tigers. He looks strong. He looks smart. Players seem to respect him and like him. I actually expect pretty good, a better season this year from the Tigers than they had last year, um, even with Fielder being gone. The flop. The flop. I don't know if anyone saw the flop of the playoffs last year, where Fielder jumped to third base and just landed in the middle. <laughs> that yeah, was like the uh, recap of our, our season. I think Detroit's putting a great baseball team on the field. I think they're good enough to make it to the championship game and probably take Baltimore all the way to six games uh, before losing this. <laughs> yeah, right. You wish. <laughs> who'd you guys? Who'd you guys give up again? The pitcher. We gave up our club, but we just signed two pitchers. Oh, I didn't see that. Uh, we, we signed uh, Jimenez, and we signed a kid from South Korea whose name is absolutely. Um, unpronounceable, but he was three-time All-Star over there. Um, I think it's like a 3.29 ERA. So we could knock on wood. We could actually have a real pitching staff this year. Well, that, would, that I think you guys need it, but it, you guys still aren't going to take us in six games. But we'll see. Well, you know, we'll have, we'll have you another. Might, you might take us to seven, but you know. <clears throat> It's not even know, spring training yet. We're, we already got the shit talking going. It's not even spring training. Yeah, I mean, we're in the American League East. We don't get to beat up on Cleveland and the White Sox <laughs> you know, 20, 20, 21 times a year. You know. All right, well. The twins. I mean, that's a power to do you guys got going there. Hey, we made it, we made it to, the, uh, to the World Series two times in the last, what is it, seven years? We didn't win it, but got swept by the Giants right. and lost to the Cardinals. Go Lions. Listen, How about that? <laughs> <laughs> it's All right, Tim. All right. Here. I'm signing off. Um, thanks, everyone, right. for watching, and we'll see you guys hopefully next week with the next book review. Okay, great. Have a good night, Kyle.